we spoke about how in this heaven series we talk about how now God wants to reveal Himself and train each one of us in this move. And we have reached the stage where we are interacting with the angels and the saints in heaven. And they are more or less training each one of us for this wonderful great move that God has for us. In a sense we talk about living in heaven and working on earth. And that's the level that God wants us so that every time we spend time with God, we understand what it means to be in the heavenly place, heavenly places, and then come down to the earth to do our work. And this is what the bride of Christ does. And we have given scriptures over the last week, and we illustrated with Sadhu Sunda Singh and how he was called by God into the dimension of the heavenly places. And he walk and talk with uh, in the heavenly realm with saints and with angels, and we quoted from some of uh, uh, the parts of his book from the spiritual world. And also, when he asked the uh, saints of God on what basis of scripture that he was enjoying what we call the communion of the saints. He was given the book of Zechariah about those who walk with God and as they obey God, God take them to uh, be among those that stand uh, in the midst of, of uh, the people of God. And that verse we talked about last week referred to the saints. And he was told he referred to the saints in the book of Zechariah. We also speak about how in... Uh, Jesus time that he worked with angels, he interacted with angels, we saw that in the Garden of Gethsemane, we saw that in the time after the 40 day fast and prayer or testing where he was tested by uh, Satan that the angels came and ministered to him after that in Mark chapter 1. So he does interact with the angels and he interacted with the saints as we saw in the Mount of Transfiguration with Moses and Elijah. And we also know that uh, Paul the Apostle in 2 Corinthians 12 went to the third heaven and he said he spoke, he, he heard things that he could not speak about. He could not speak or sound this thing. But in his writings, he, some of the revelation in his writing came from those experiences. And so we have Zechariah, we have the life of Jesus, we have the life of Paul that supports the basis of our interaction with the saints. We also have uh, uh, more scriptures and uh, we spoke about in Ephesians chapter 3. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 3. And as you turn into the Bible, we speak about how in these uh, end times, that more and more we are reaching the stage where we are interacting with the spiritual realm. We learn to walk in the spiritual realm and learn about things in the Bible and, and meet with men and women of God who show us things as they happen in the Bible. Because the Bible considers in uh, Ephesians chapter 3, Ephesians chapter 3, and uh, Paul's prayer in verse 14 and 15, he says here, for this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. Now notice, is a whole family, just one family in heaven and earth. You are not considered half-half. Uh, the whole family, including those uh, Old Testament saints who have gone on to be with the Lord. And for us today, after 2,000 years of Christianity, that about 2,000 years of Christianity, there are also so the saints who have gone before us in the New Testament time. And they are all one family together with us. What God is doing has never been done before. We also see in chapter 3 that Paul implies that what God is about to do in our time, in the New Testament time, has never been done before in verse 8. Look at verse 8 on what's in Ephesians chapter 3. To me who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Now we all know 1 Corinthians 11 
that First Corinthians 11 has been used by Paul by many churches for the Lord's Supper and Paul writes how he received from the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed every one of us know that Paul was born again only after some time uh, way after the cross the resurrection the day of Pentecost and uh, the Christians existing and uh, then he was way under Acts 9 which remember was even after the seven deacons were appointed in Acts chapter 6 so Paul definitely was not there physically on the night Jesus was betrayed so Paul must have these experiences where he's taken back to the time where the Lord's Supper actually is taking place and he would have seen it, he must have interacted and seen exactly how it is and the Bible talks about it in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 as if Paul was a first-hand witness how was he the first-hand witness? it is through the communion of the saints so let's read on in Ephesians chapter 3 verse 8 this communion is mentioned in verse 9 because the word communion comes from the word koinonia koinonia has been translated fellowship and it says here in verse 9 and to make all see what is the koinonia communion of fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God who created all things through Jesus Christ to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. Now you notice that that was implied interaction between earth and heaven. Look at it very carefully. Who are the principalities and powers? And he's not talking about uh, just the bad guys. I know that in the book of Ephesians in chapter 6, uh, there are the bad guys where there are principalities and powers and wicked spirits in the high places, also in heavenly places, but the lower realm of the heavenly places which is above the atmosphere of the earth. We also know that there's a good part of the heavenly place which is Ephesians chapter 1, that God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. And then Ephesians chapter 2, we have been seated with Christ in the heavenly places. And then in Ephesians chapter 1 in the prayer, he also talked about how God was exalted and seated above all principality and powers. And that's not talking about the bad guys. He's talking about the good guys, principalities and powers. And those are angels, angelic beings, and all the various powers of God on the kingdom of God. Then it says in verse 9, to make all see what is this fellowship? What is this communion? What is this partnership? What is this Greek word koinonia? Of the mystery which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things to Jesus Christ, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church, by the church, to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. And then when he prayed on, that is why he talked about in verse 15, the one family of God in heaven and on earth. It's like heaven and earth has become one. The church of Jesus Christ. Why, how is that possible? Because the presence of God has come to the earth in answer to Paul's prayer and he's speaking in faith. He's speaking about how when we are filled with the presence of God on earth. Let's have more scriptures for that in uh, the book of Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. He names all the men and women of God in chapter 11. In chapter 11, he names uh, Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Sarah, and uh, Isaac, Joseph, Moses, and uh, some he never named. Uh, he just mentioned their works, all Gideon, Barak, David, Samuel, the prophets, and all these others, men and women of God in chapter 11. What I call the roll call of faith in chapter 11. Then chapter 12 verse 1 Therefore we also since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses let us lay aside every weight and a sin which so easily ensnares us 
Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. So he talks about the heavenly realm and all these heroes of faith. Uh, then he turns to us in the New Testament and he says, Let us run in the midst uh, of these witnesses that are there. Let us run the race on earth. Because they have finished the race, we are still running the race. And at this time, as we read, Paul himself had finished the race. And many of the New Testament saints have finished the race. So they have joined the cloud of witnesses and they are looking at us in the end times. We are not the one, one running the race. And then if you read on in chapter 12 of the book of Hebrews, it says in verse 18, For you have not come to the mountain that may be touched and that burn with fire, and to blackness and darkness and tempest, and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words, so that those who heard it back that the word should not be spoken to them anymore. Talking about the Old Testament. For they could not endure what was commanded, and if so much as a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned or shot with an arrow. And so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I am exceedingly afraid and trembling. That was the old covenant. See, we didn't come to that. But it says, we didn't go to Mount Sinai. But in verse 22, it says, we have come to Mount Zion. We have come to Mount Zion. And in verse 22, to the city of the living God. The heavenly Jerusalem. To an innumerable company of angels. To the general assembly and church of the firstborn. Who are registered in heaven. Who are they? The saints. Those who have gone on before us. Plus the saints who have gone, died and gone on to be with the Lord at this time. To God, the judge of all, to the spirits of just men make perfect. Now when Paul wrote the book of Hebrews, he had a lot of revelation about who Melchizedek was from his heavenly vision. And Paul is talking about this, in chapter 11, he talks about this cloud of witnesses. And this cloud of witnesses that now, in Hebrews, he talk about how we interact with them. In Ephesians 3, he talk about interacting with them. And here in Hebrews chapter 12, he talk about us interacting with them. Where is Mount Zion? He's not talking about Israel at this time. Mount Zion is the heavenly place. Mount Zion is where the saints are gathered together. He says, to the city of the living God. I know there is a fulfillment on the planet earth in the book of Revelation. But here he says, We have come. We have come to Mount Zion. Where is your Mount Zion? The heavenly place. The city of the living God. Where God is on the throne. That's why verse 23 make it very clear. Where God on the throne. You have come to the company of angels. You have come to the general assembly and church of the firstborn. Including all, the general assembly include all the Old Testament saints. And uh, to the spirits of just men made perfect. You have come to the heavenly place. So these are all verses that speak about this end time revival. And this is a revival that is taking place from now onwards. Not only are you going to be trained by the saints over these two, three years, but having been trained by them, you're going to, after this time, live in heaven, walk on earth. Say, live in heaven, walk on earth. Live in heaven, walk on earth. And that is going to take place in this end time church, the bride of Christ. And you notice what happened after that. In verse 25, 26, 27, the prophecy of the tsunami in 2029. So this revival is on track. This passage of the Bible is prophetic in a sense. Although it's not fully recorded as a prophecy, it is prophetic. It speaks about the end time move when we come to the company of innumerable company of angels. When we come to the general assembly, the 
people of God, the heavenly hosts, the firstborn, church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, to God the judge of all, to his throne room, to the spirits of just men, make perfect. Paul talks as if this is happening in his time and prophetically fulfilled in our time. After the tsunami that takes place in verse 26, 27, in our time also. These are all prophetic verses. And uh, so as we talk about interacting with heaven and all those things, uh, when we talk about uh, uh, me having a vision, or Sam having a vision, or Natasha having a vision, you know, most of you say, oh, these are the people who see vision. So I just, uh, uh, in, over the week, I met with several ones of you. So I'm calling some of you to just share some of the things that have started occurring in your life recently. And so you know that uh, there are ma many people, some of you have sent me online some of your things, and also some of you here, to know that in this revival, there are the 12 plus 70 plus 120 and the second generation, then there are 30 plus 70 plus um, uh, 120 in the first generation. Altogether, you would have uh, and remember, there are some people who are not even among these who are always there. And they are ready, they are among the 7,000 ready to take the place of any of these when they fail. And so you can imagine that in this revival, suddenly you have about 500 people who begin to walk in heaven and live in heaven, encounter heaven, encounter the angels, encounter the saints, and then walk on earth. Can you imagine? It's not just one person with open vision, two person with open vision, three person or four person. It's a group of 500 over people that are going to experience visions and uh, dialogue in heaven and see some of the wonderful things of God and be trained in heaven and then come down and perform some of the things God has on earth. And He has already begun. So let me start off uh, by calling, uh, well, uh, let me mix up a bit, second generation and first generation. So let me start with uh, TL and Melissa and share some of the things that you have. And you would think that you know, uh, TL might not have downloaded, but he has begun to have downloads too. So that's why you're going to encourage some of you who, who you know, might have. Um, so just share in summary, whichever one on you. Praise the Lord. And, uh, so, first generation has it, second generation has it. And, uh, oh, praise the Lord. You got the mic on? Thank you. Probably the last, probably the last, uh, all right, Leslie. Leslie. <laughs> okay, probably the last one you expect to... Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, um, uh, I think it was on Monday, I think, because I had to meet the uh, pastor for <clears throat> those, uh, what you call that, those training. And uh, this, uh, I guess I was just joking with him that maybe the angels were giving something so that I had something to talk to him about. Right now, I'll be staring at him, he's staring at me. <laughs> so, uh, uh, because after all nowadays, a lot of you have a lot of downloads, so, you know, if you have anything, no download to talk to him about, you get very... Very boring. <laughs> Pastor does not want to hear about normal earthly things. So the kind of story short, so on the that's about the night uh, I have uh, a dream. Uh, nowadays my dreams tend to be like a bit semi dream, semi vision thing. So uh, I saw this woman doing things. I was observing her doing a lot of ministry of the world. And it's a very uh, motherly woman and um, I was just observing her doing a lot of uh, things of God. And I cannot remember what she did, but uh, then later she turned to me, and then uh, next thing I know, I was lying down, and she was looking down on me, and then she touched my forehead, right? And then she said, you will continue my work. And then, at that moment, I woke up a bit, and I felt a tingling sensation on my forehead, and, uh, and then I thought, the thing will go away, the tingling sensation will go away, and I just say, and I thought, ah, maybe I'm... High tide, so I go to the toilet. <laughs> so I woke up in the night, that was 3 o'clock, I went to the toilet. I came back, I lie down on the bed, and I was just tossing to and fro, trying to sleep. And about 10 minutes later, trying to sleep, and then suddenly, suddenly I just reminded that, hey, wait a minute, someone touched me. 
you know. And uh, I say, hey, who's that touch me? Then I'm thinking about, oh, maybe I should go back and sleep and then maybe I can reconnect with, with that person again. And then right then, then I realized that uh, it was Catherine Kuhlman uh, who, who touched my forehead and uh, it was her that I realized that she was saying to me that uh, to continue uh, the work. And uh, so of course I was not that convinced, you know, knowing me. I spoke to the pastor and the pastor said, what's my help? What's my heart feel? Uh, in the dream, I didn't see her face, but in my heart, I know that it was her. And uh, just about then, then I talked to him. The very next, the very next day after talking to him, uh, in the evening, uh, the Lord reminded me of a book uh, which I shared with Pastor Eddie before in 2012. Uh, in that book uh, was a gentleman by the name of Dave Robertson. He was actually called to the ministry, also in the dream. And in that dream, a woman minister was ministering. And in the woman ministry, it was under a lot of power and, and demonstration of power. And the woman pointed to him and said that, I do not know why God called me, but because maybe you men failed. And he was pointing at the men. And then the Lord reminded me, it was the same catching woman that had called that man to the ministry that actually the Lord introduced the book to me to the job. So it was the same book that I shared with uh, Pastor Eddie. So it was no coincidence. That's it. Hi, I'm Melissa. <laughs> um, Friday night, last Friday night, when the pastor was praying for everyone's angels and their background. Um, prior to that, uh, pastor started sharing testimony of Sam, Arion, and kind of having visitations and all that and that sort of jolted my memory about something that I experienced during the Seven Churches trip uh, in May last year. Uh, after we did all the uh, altar building, we went back to Pergamos for uh, two more days and uh, the, the testimonies that were shared recently reminded me of a dream I had in Pergamos last May that um, Apostle John, um, in my dream, I heard a voice saying, I'm Apostle John, I want you to read Revelations, blah, blah, blah. But then I didn't catch it and I woke up, you know, wondering like, whoa, what's that? And we went to Patmos during that, that trip as well. Um, so I thought that it was simply my sheer imagination and so I, I didn't tell pastor, that was last May and then recently a pastor started sharing about the visitations from saints and all that and that was how I remember that dream and then last Friday when pastor, uh, when it was my turn to uh, um, when it was, it was my turn to come up and the uh, pastor was sharing about my angels then I mustered courage to tell him about the dream and just to ask him whether uh, you know was I really dreaming or it was really really you know true and then he just said oh wait Apostle John said yes <laughs> I was like oh wow I should ask him to ask some more things for me <laughs> like what am I supposed to read right but anyway I did pray and um, and I said, uh, you know, uh, sorry I missed you last May. <laughs> and uh, so I prayed and said, what do you want me to read in Revelation? So he, so then I got, you know, the chapters. And um, interestingly, uh, you know, Revelation 4, chapter 4, and I turned to it and it was like, oh, the throne room of heaven. It was like, wow, how, I mean, nothing happens by coincidence. And, you know, Pastor was teaching on a series of throne room of heaven. Then, uh, so that was Friday night, so, so I, I, you know, I had, you know, was encouraged that I wasn't, you know, dreaming, it wasn't my imagination. Then, Tuesday, we were supposed to meet Pastor for some, you know, uh, training, and uh, Monday, I had, Monday when I was praying, um, no, no, sorry. Tuesday when we met at Pastor um, for training, 
Uh, while we are praying, before we start our session, we always have an hour, one hour praying. As I was praying, I was praying in the Spirit, I was focusing on the goodness of the Lord. And uh, in the, for after, I think about after about 15-20 minutes, I then suddenly I saw a vision. And uh, I saw a vision of a cave. And then as I looked, there was a man sitting there, in, you know, wearing a white robe. And there was a man sitting inside a cave. And I was standing outside the cave. And then I looked, and then in my heart, I just knew that there was Apostle John. So then he said, come, come in, you know. Uh, and he asked me to sit down, so I sat next to him. And then I just looked at him, and then I said, uh, are you going to teach me something? <laughs> Then he said, yes. Then I asked him, what, what do you want to teach me? And he said, the love of God. And he said, I'm going to show you the cross, what happened at the cross. So at that point, I started tearing and I just couldn't take it. I, and then I couldn't pray. So I, I was sitting on the chair and I got up from the chair and I walked away uh, from the from the living room because I just couldn't, you know, take it when you say, I'm, I'm going to show you what happened at the cross, you know. So then when I told Pastor and I checked Pastor, you know, and I described to him how Pastor John looked like, he said, yes, you know, and then he said that, uh, uh, you know, take your time, you know, uh, like yourself, <laughs> you know, so, okay. And uh, I also uh, shared with him that I had a vision uh, when I first joined COG and uh, I saw myself training a group of people uh, in a white building and next to me was visibly an angel. Seems like the angel was either tra training, putting words into my mouth as I train or training together with me. I wasn't so sure and then pastor said, you know that vision you saw you are teaching, you know, the love of God to the to the people in the group. Then, um, so that was uh, okay. So then, my, uh, Tuesday went back home. Wednesday, uh, Wednesday afternoon, as I was praying, um, the Pastor John appeared, and uh, this time he asked me to uh, sit next to, and then he asked me to sit next to him, and I had a no big notebook on my lap. And he was telling me about, you know, um, how God put in us a heart of flesh and that, you know, we need the word to keep us from sin. And he also uh, picked up a stone and showed me, you know, what a heart of stone represents. Then the next thing I knew was he, we were sort of like um, standing mid-air in the universe. Uh, it seems like we were standing on an invisible bridge that sort of like uh, yeah it was an invisible bridge and uh, I was standing next to him he was on my right and I could and I was like literally in the universe and I could see the planets uh, several of the planets and uh, I asked him you know what is this and he said that look you know, this is just part of the universe, but it's so huge. She said, look at how big your God is. Look at how big, you know, God's love is for you all. And it was, it was just, you know, amazing. You know, and, and when I told Pastor that, um, he told me that, you know, I you know, should just meditate on the bigness of God's love. You know, and, and expand my heart to absorb that, and so that you know more will come to me. And today, this afternoon, when I was praying, um, um, he showed me something which I am still absorbing. Um, it, it was leading to the cross and was showing me about just how amazing God is and how incredibly big he is to you know just come into the form of man 
you know, and to go to the cross, to send his son to the cross. So, um, I, I, I was crying all the way and, uh, you know, he also showed, also brought me through my, my own life from the day I was born to now, all the, you know, the, the hurts that I went through, you know, come, I mean, uh, growing up in a broken home and, you know, things like that, totally just, you know, lack of fatherly love, things like that. So, just brought me through that process of my life. I, I, I suppose it's, you know, healing in, in process so that I truly can comprehend the weave, the death, the land in the height of God's love and make it so real and in such a deeper and new dimension so that, you know, when I share with people about God's love, it will be so, so real. I, I, I believe that is my journey for now. Praise the Lord. And uh, Sandy? Yes. So these are just the beginning. There's a lot more different interaction that's coming to each one, even who share. Good evening, brothers and sisters. <coughs> Two weeks ago, when, pa when Pastor started to share about communicating in the Spirit, uh, then I had a problem because. Um, I never knew that um, you can communicate with the saints. Um, understanding a little bit about trans being translated. So, <clears throat> just after that Sunday service that evening, I experienced when I sensed Pastor came to my room. Um, I was having a hard, my attitude was, even I can sense Pastor, and I say, Pastor, my Lord, I am not used to this yet. So I did not turn. That was my heart's condition. Because I do not know what I should do. Um, I need a lot of uh, word, even though the word was given to me. But I need the revelation that you just know in your spirit. Somehow, Usually when a word comes, it can ignite you and you will know there is a confirmation. And if you read the word, there is a prompting in your heart that says that this is it. So what happened is, I sought the Lord and I said, I truly need a revelation. Show me through your word. Apart from what Pastor has been sharing. And the Lord truly is gracious. I stand here today. And I just want you to know that I am not a greater person than anybody here. I always feel that I cannot measure the grace of God. It is too enormous for me. And His mercy, needless to say, I do not deserve. But yet, time and time again, His forgiveness is endless in my life. So He showed me, as Pastor was sharing in Hebrews, chapter 12, verse 22. When I read it, it blew my mind. And I said that I love the book of Hebrew, but the word becomes alive. <clears throat> since the trip from Pagamos when we came back, well, you would say that COG, if you look at every one of us, we have dreams and we have vision. As I come back from Mokawe, receive prophecy and anointing upon anointing every online prayer meeting. And I keep it in my heart because God is not a liar. When you receive this anointing, it grows deep in your spirit. And then, just one day, which is recently, I went up to heaven which I think that this cannot be true. And I continue to press on. And I met the Lord Jesus. Well, if you meet the Lord Jesus, you will not be in a state whereby you say, Hi Lord. Because 
He is holy. When you approach Him, it's with fear and with trembling. And I saw in this place a river that is flowing in the midst, and there were many of us, many of them, seated just in the river that is flowing. And then I saw Pastor Johan. He was wearing a crown, and he was directing the people into the throne room. And I met with him, and he said, Sandy, this is your seat. It is real. So I went forward, and there were many saints there. The saints which I saw, the first person, he had a ring. He's very clean, very clean. And that was Joseph. And I, you know, just, just greeted. And after that, I saw Prophet Ezekiel. He's the person which I did not you know. If you tell me, he will not say, Hi, I'm Prophet Ezekiel. In your spirit, you meet God with him. Okay? He looked a bit like rowdy and he hasn't had any slippers. And straight away I said, Oh, Prophet Ezekiel. And next to Prophet Ezekiel, this man, tall and he's very handsome. Looks very young. And he is Daniel. And then, here comes this man. Okay? He, you, you can sense that such power upon his life. A glimpse of fire. Now, all this, as I'm saying, I have checked with Pastor. And he is the prophet. Elijah. I say, wow, oh, okay. He gives me the sense of like, you know, calling down fire. The next minute, I saw what seems like an exodus, a man that is white, in face, in hair. He was leading the exodus, and the exodus was, I will never believe, it was very orderly. Now we're talking about millions of people that came up from Egypt. And then after that, I saw this stout man, nearly bald, and he's the apostle Paul. And standing right next to Pastor Johan, this tall man, and I turned, and Pastor Johan introduced and said, this is Apostle Peter. I humbly took my seat, sat down, and I was ready for training. And just a few days ago, the first download of my training, I met with the young Oya. Another person I saw was King David. He was wearing a crown in his warrior suit, and he holds a sword. And he has an army that is with him. My first training was with King David when he was only a shepherd, tending to his father's sheep. A vision I saw what he was doing when he was attending the sheep. Attending the sheep, I have learned much from him because it is not just a shepherd taking a staff and just looking after the sheep. More so through the vision which I have <clears throat> on King David, the shepherd. He's very meticulous and he's excellent in his duties. He knows all his sheep. And in that vision, as a shepherd, as a shepherd boy, you would think that he's just taking out the sheep to grace and all that. But some of the details that I've, sh I've seen is that how he separated the pregnant, the young sheep and all this. These are some of the things that he did. And while he was in, out, taking the sheep to grace, <clears throat> he is a man who loved to worship. Yes, I know in the Bible, but when you're in the vision and he loved to worship, that means I saw an instrument which he carried, which in the Bible we talk about harp, but to me it does not look like a harp. It's a string instrument, it is small. And I feel that all the time when he goes out, he carries with him all the time. And when he finds a spot to rest at night, he is a man that is outdoors. He will go under the sky 
gaze the star, gaze the moon, and he would open up. He loved God's word. Now, amazing thing that's happening to me now is, as the vision is there, we all read God's word, but we will not be able to. If somebody say, um, "Oh, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me," okay, this one you know, Galatians two twenty. But the things which David loved, the word of God, he will lift up his hand. And he will praise God. Turn to Psalms one one nine verse two, and then turn to Psalms one one nine verse forty six and forty seven. He's talking about what what David loved to do. So I said yes. Then there's also this verse, because why? David is known for this famous uh, famous word that says, "He is the man that is after God's own heart." Acts thirteen. So I said, why is that so? But when I see David, how he worshipped the Lord, he worshipped. Don't forget, he's in the desert, in the wilderness. So when he sings, when he strums his musician, his music, the shepherds that's from the distance could hear his voice, as his voice travelled in the night. The voice that penetrates through the night, the song touches the heart of man, and that's why he is known as. A very talented musician. Now, when I saw that sight, and when I see that a shepherd boy, with his starting as a ministry and a shepherd boy being faithful and all that, then the Lord would appoint him, and he would be the second king of Israel. Until today, and I also come across and say that yes, there is a lot of verses. There is a lot of him representing the messianic. Jesus, because we always use him as saying, he's the seed, right? He's the son of David. Jesus, the son of David. So you see, David is such an important man. When we think that he started as a shepherd, so today I look at myself, and I humble myself, and I say, who am I, Lord, that you should impart such a vision unto me? And I remember the words of Pastor. There are five hundred. Right. I do not know physically if that's 500, but if I see in the spirit, it is more than just 500. It's like from here, as what as Pastor said, all of you has been to the throne room, but your soul has not come to realization. I share this. I pray that it will encourage your heart. That very soon you will see the throne room. Thank you. Cheers. Praise the Lord. And uh, so also some from the second uh, generation, uh, Moses, Elijah as well. We visiting Natasha. We visiting our uh, Arion in United States. And uh, Catherine Kumar as well visited Ishani. Remember, and some other different ones also met with her. And uh, so uh, many things are happening. And uh, so Ishani just come and share a little bit uh, of uh, your downloads. Praise the Lord. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Um, um, you, if you want to use this book, is it? Ah, the second book. Put your things yeah. down. Um, Easier for you. Actually, this uh, revelation I got on, uh, I received uh, this revelation on 15th of January, and um, I thought I'll share with you this one because um, I was actually woken up around 2:30 a.m. So you still have another two hours to go. <laughs> so, <laughs> so there's still hope. <laughs> so. Um, yeah, so um, actually, um, I was woken up. Um, I sensed um, it was an angel because, um, um, yeah, because it was an impartation. So I could sense um, um, I couldn't go back to sleep after that. So um, yeah, and I was led to meditate on Matthew 16:18 to 19. I thought I would share with you this one because this is a. Uh, uh, For all of us, actually, this one um, here 
um, says uh, Matthew 16, verse 17 to 19. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Verse 18. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Verse 19. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So, um, it's actually for the glorious church, I was told, um, because I kept meditating upon it, and I asked the Lord, um, what is, uh, why um, this verse? So, it is for all of us. Um, then, um, I also, I, I was also caught up, um, caught up to the throne of God, and I met Apostle Paul there. And he asked me to meditate on the few verses, but I'm not going <laughs> to share these verses pretty long. So, um, yeah. And um, another um, encounter I had with um, Apostle John, and he asked me to read Revelation. I think quite a few of us had that Revelation, so we are together. <laughs> so, <laughs> and um, then I um, saw Pastor John's house in heaven on a hill, and I met his dog. He's chubby and happy. And Pastor Johan gave me a scroll. Actually, I want to share this uh, this vision because um, quite a while back I, I've been receiving scrolls. Oh, sorry, Pastor Johan. I've been receiving scrolls, but I wasn't paying attention. I um, a few times um, I think he um, he he just appeared, and I, I think I like Sister Sandy. I wasn't sure, so I just turned back. <laughs> I, uh, and I could also hear his voice a few times, but I wasn't sure who it is, because normally we don't see pastors in visions. So I wasn't sure who, who's this, why is he, <laughs> sorry, why, why he's talking to me. So I, it's actually quite a while, but um, after the Canberra trip, I think it was, um, I, it, it was just, um, I, I do it college, sorry. Yeah, so, um, because it's so real. So, um, yeah, so, um, um, yeah, so, um, 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 another incident, Pastor Johan came, um, came to impart something. I was, as I was praying in tongues, God also gave me a vision how the entire church would be like. We all would be like a big, um, like a big family of God. We'd have many spiritual and physical children. I'm talking this one about uh, my, my vision. Agape love would be perfected in the entire church. And we all would be tested on our love for the family of God and love of ourselves. Um, so there are a few visions. Um, can we share some more? Or, uh, okay. Um, this one actually is very interesting. This one is, um, I had a dream, and in that dream, um, Pastor was, um, yeah, it was like, whatever Pastor was speaking on Sunday's sermon, um, it was becoming like a spirit being, as if whatever was speaking was taking shape. And it was so real, because normally uh, my dreams um, doesn't come with that clarity, so it was, um, after I woke up from my sleep, I was, um, I told my husband <laughs> I said, I, I, about the dream, so that's something um, very, um, very real. And um, I also met with Catherine Kuhlman, and um, she was imparting something to me as well, uh, just like she did um, to Brother Teal and Brother Teal, and, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Mrs. Oh, okay. Okay, wait <laughs> Okay, and I think it's more like how to interact with people, the audience, um, yeah, and also, um, um, yeah, and 
she says that God watches over his word to perform it. And um, um, he's just waiting for people to find in their hearts according to the will of God. And we cannot grieve the spirit, but to flow with it. And um, also, um, uh, uh, Moses is actually taking me through Genesis um, on a regular basis. Um, yeah, and the Bible is coming alive more and more. Thank you. And uh, I got all those uh, to share so that uh, you can have an inkling of uh, all the different experiences. And after some time, as everybody gets their download and they're trained, you, at a certain stage, uh, you'll be allowed to begin to interact and share with one another your downloads. And you'll be surprised how you meet the same people and they teach you slightly different things. This is an exciting time that we're moving to. Uh, there are very few times in the history of church revivals when you have the Holy Spirit pour out upon a group of people and they simultaneously have visions. Once in a while you find that happening, you, you, you do have that in the Bible, in Acts chapter 2, when the first outpouring of the Holy Spirit and people have visions and dreams and all those things. H.A. Baker speaks about it in the Adulam Orphanage here in China where all the uh, orphans had a revival because the Holy Spirit poured out on them and some of them saw under the end time, they even saw under the Antichrist. Uh, and, and that was some time back, a decades back ago. The children must have grown up and I, I wonder what happened to them. So during the times of revival, the Spirit do pour out upon each one of us. And this is a revival that's happening when God moves, sometimes God does not move in a way we expect or in a way that we thought that He would move, but He does move. God always answers prayer. He doesn't always answer prayer in a way we expect. All we can do is believe that God will answer prayer. So to, tonight and this morning, we're going to teach about how to continue to access heaven and understand the principles behind each of these uh, sharing that's going on. Let me read more scripture. Uh, I've already given scriptures which uh, establish the ground rules and, and uh, the opening that these experiences are biblical based on all the scriptures I've given to you about communion with the saints, koinone, a fellowship of family in heaven and on earth, and Hebrews 12, which was uh, uh, given to Sandy. When, uh, when we met up for training and she talked about that verse and I said, yes, that's a, a, a beautiful verse that can be also used to support this in that we come to an innumerable num company of angels and uh, to general assembly and the firstborn registered in heaven and all uh, of the spirits of just man make perfect and how we have come to this stage of this revival. In Acts chapter 2, it says there in verse 17 to 21, It shall come to pass in the last day, says the Lord, that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions, your old men shall dream dreams. And all my men servants and all my maid servants, I will pour out my Spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy. I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, Blood, fire, vapor, or smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. This verse follows the same order as Hebrews chapter 12 where you have, uh, you have us coming to the company of angels, the innumerous uh, number of saints, where we interact with them. And then verse 26 uh, comes a tsunami and uh, where the, the whole world is realigned into what God wants in the end of times. It tells us here in chapter 2 verse 17 
that firstly there is this outpouring of the Spirit, there are visions and revelations and uh, prophetic words that come to God's people. Immediately after that, you see in verse 19, the signs and the wonders. And that is what is happening. We are now in a period of visions, dreams, prophecies, uh, in this first wave of the revival. And it is so real, it is so distinct. The second part will be the signs and wonders. So what's going to happen is we will live in heaven, we will work and walk on earth, and in the spiritual realm as it takes place, there will come a time when the spiritual realm will interact with the natural realm. Already some of the downloads that some of you are experiencing, you are being trained for signs and wonders. You are being trained for transportation in the spirit. You are being trained for different things. When the training is completed, then God can easily interact into the physical world. And by the time you begin to interact in the physical world, you realize how real the training was. When you begin to see miracles like five loaves, two fishes, multiply the feet, five thousand. When you begin to see transportation in the spirit and in the natural when you begin to see how easy it is to heal the sick and there's no more struggle. When you see tumors and cancers melt before your very eyes. Then you realize that the spiritual world will intersect with this natural world that is taking place. Uh, that is why in this move we are being taught about the heavenly places. So let's flow with this revival and allow God to deposit, train us and impart the energies that He has for us. Getting ready for the next wave of revival that will be operating in signs and wonders. See, by the time we walk and live in the spiritual realm so much, walking on earth is the simplest thing. And doing the signs and wonders for earth is a very simple thing. You won't have the struggle uh, or the preconceived idea that you're going to struggle so much in order to bring one simple healing. Because the type of healings you're going to bring forth are more than healings. Creating miracles. We're going to see uh, people without arms growing new arms or instantly having an arm. People without legs having new legs. People with organs that have been removed from them, perhaps as a kidney removed and surviving one kidney, suddenly is replaced and they have a new kidney. And these are some of the signs and wonders that are going to come easily. It's going to be just in a moment of time because we are getting used to the spiritual realm, spiritual dimension. You see how Jesus, when He heals, how simple it was. There is no struggle. There was no delay. Uh, it was very simple. He just does exactly as the Father showed him. Because our Lord Jesus always said, The Son of Man is from heaven. What is from above is from above. What is from beneath is beneath. Our Lord Jesus Christ walked in heaven, live in heaven, He worked on earth and walk on earth. He live in heaven, He work on earth. And that's what God is bringing us to in order to do the works of Jesus. We will not just do the works of Jesus, but we will do the works of Jesus in the same manner in which He did. Without struggle. Effortlessly. Now let's continue in this teaching tonight to bring you all deeper to understand where we are coming from. Um, let's look at Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 10 and to verse 12. This is the process that is important for Matthew chapter 5, verse 8, where it says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 10 to verse 12. For he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his own works, as God did from His. And then it goes on to verse 11, Child, Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. 
For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. I'd like to bring you here that even when Paul was writing the book of Hebrews, not many Christians at his time experienced this. Paul did experience it. He's been to the third heaven. And he knew. I met with the Apostle Paul, spoke with him in the spirit. And he knew that there will come a time, like our time, but the Apostle Paul is very excited. He's here with us tonight too. He's very excited. And the saints are also still with us like the last week. And watching us, we are being watched by this cloud of witnesses together with uh, innumerable number and company of angels around us. Plus the four living creatures. Four living creatures who have been energizing different things. And I talk about what they're energizing is uh, in, in bringing us to heaven. See, there's, there's a law of the Spirit that is operating here. It takes one that is above us to bring us to the place where they are. It's not like a mountain you can climb. Remember, even in salvation, we cannot save ourselves. No matter how much you try, it's only good works. It takes Jesus who is from above to come down to where we are to bring us up to where He is. And you will notice that, uh, uh, for example, uh, here's this piano stool that when you're climbing a mountain, all that this, of course, is easy. And many of you, some of you climb mountains uh, together in the prayer walks or, or hard places. When a person is above and you're below, it is the person above who can pull you up to where he is. But you trying to go up by yourself, in the natural you might be able to. It might be a slow process, hard process. It always takes some from above to pull you up. Not someone from below pushing you. This is a spiritual law. That you need that which is above to bring us up. And this revival is being energized by the Lord Jesus. But he has also commissioned the four living creatures. You know the four living creatures around the throne. Even when Kenneth Hagin went to the throne room, he saw the living creature. Jesus was speaking to him actually at the heavenly place. And he is smiling down even now because he knew what we're talking about. And he was in a heavenly place, but it was not fully revealed in his time. And as he was speaking to Jesus in his book, I believe in visions of the throne room, when he was looking at the four living creatures, Jesus was telling him to look. Because the time hasn't come for the end, the end, uh, the end times, uh, the, the days, the real end of the days. The last of the last of the end time. Remember in Acts chapter uh, 2, it was the end times. It was the last days. We are now in the end of days, as the book of Daniel says. And it's for our time that God has released, not because of who we are. Remember, let no one become proud. Let no one become highly exalted. Let no one begin to think it is what they have done. It is not. It's by virtue of the fact that we live towards the end of days and is the predestination of God. That in the end of days, He wanted to release this revival. And so even the four living creatures are energizing this revival in order to bring about the bride of Christ in formation of the glory of God. As they were in the heavens where Ezekiel and uh, also Isaiah actually saw it, and John the Apostle saw it, 
when they saw the four living creatures with the face of a man, the face of a, a lion, and the face of an eagle, and the face of a calf, and they cried, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. That same presence is going to come on this earth. Ephesians 1 pray for it, Ephesians 3 pray for it, that the fullness of the presence of God will be on the earth, correct? It tells us in that verse. Let me uh, uh, just jump to that verse so it, that we are aware of the scriptural basis of what God is doing. In Ephesians chapter 1, at the end of the prayer, Ephesians chapter 1, at the end of the prayer, it says in verse 22, And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. That's the same fullness that fills heaven. That is to be filled in the church. Ephesians chapter 3, at the end of Paul's prayer, he says in verse 19, To know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. It's obvious that the fullness of God involves the same fullness of God as manifested in heaven above. That's why this revival is also being energized by the four living creatures that God is uh, releasing upon the earth, even right now. He starts re releasing about individuals because who are the church? The church are individuals like you and I. We all made up the church. The church is not just a building. Uh, there's the church building. Church are the people. And we are the church that God is energizing. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. In order to understand how to move and flow in that which God is releasing, we could teach this thing five years ago. And it would be different. If even if I teach these things five years ago, very few people will enter because it was not time yet. But now that is initiated by God in heaven, then we teach this, it helps those who are receiving to process it deeper. Uh, so, there are three types of visions. All these are visions that are flowing. There are three types of vision. There is, as I say, open vision, where you see the natural and the spiritual at the same time. That's why it's called open. Your natural eyes is still open. Then the opposite of it is closed vision. In a closed vision, your natural senses are closed up. You cannot see or feel in a natural. You only see in a spiritual. And so, open vision, both the spiritual and the natural are open. In a closed vision, spiritual is open, the natural is closed. In the third type of vision, I call it the spiritual vision or inner vision. In a spiritual or inner vision, both are sort of slight, both are still open, and, uh, but it is from some part of you on your inside, your inner eyes that you're seeing. So it's slightly different. And so you have the open vision, the closed vision, and what we would call the spiritual vision, where some part of you, uh, your, your spirit and your soul are cooperating and you're experiencing an inner vision that is there. The third type called the spiritual vision is very much close to the imagination, like the imagination, but not your imagination. The difference is you're not producing it. Something else is energizing it. So there are three types of vision. Of the three types of vision, it can be energized from inside or from outside. It can be energized from the inside or from the outside. Energized from the inside means that energizing is coming from your spirit outwards into your soul to help you to see. That's the energizing from inside. It can be energized from the outside. When it's energized from the outside, it operates like, um, uh, when it energized from the inside, it operates like Ephesians chapter 1, verse 17 and 18, where the spirit of wisdom and revelation, don't forget, 
The word is not just wisdom and revelation. What does the spirit of wisdom do when it comes? The spirit of wisdom will produce wisdom in you. What does the spirit of revelation produce? The spirit of revelation will produce the revealing of God. Although we use the word revelation to be intellectual or wisdom type of revelation, in the true Greek word sense, revelation involves seeing something. In the original Greek word. So the spirit of revelation will cause revelation something to be seen on your inside. So the energizing from the inside and example and scripture for that is Ephesians chapter 1 verse 17 and 18. The spirit of wisdom and revelation caused the eyes of your understanding to be enlightened. The Greek word enlightened is actually flooded with light. So the light is coming from your inside. Remember, to see you need light, correct? You need light. So, uh, just for a moment, just for a moment, thank you. And don't worry those of you online, this part of the illustration of all the lights. Thank you, 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 including the one on the cross. Oh. You can read your Bible, neither can I, unless it's an iPad Bible or one of your phone Bibles. But it has light. Now, in this atmosphere, and uh, I know you can't see me, because of your light, how you see me. Hey, isn't that interesting? I can read my Bible. Now, why can I read my Bible? And some of you might be able to read your Bible. Because your, if your Bible has an internal light, internal light like an iPad, correct? Or your phone has an internal light. So the light is actually coming from inside, correct? But your old type Bible, which is a printed word, which is a book, you need some light to shine, to see. So we always need light to see. Thank you. Slowly on the lights again. I needed to illustrate that the basis is see you need light so there is an energi energizing that comes from your inside and so it will be like internally lighted up and you can see then there's an energizing that comes from the outside Energizing that comes from the outside. And the energizing that comes from the outside. Okay. Let's, uh, uh, anyone here got torchlight? Thank you. Energizing from the outside. Oh, we do have a torchlight there. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And if you don't mind, we will, now this one is the button from the bottom, okay. We over the lines again. You can see this Bible. Now you see it. Now you know. Shh. But, with the light from the outside, I still can see my Bible. Right, my old Bible. And so, uh, that's, can, the light can come from the outside. And uh, so, what happens if I have both? So, and if I have both, it does help too. And uh, it's more extra, I got extra, I can see the outside, I can see uh, the inside. See, this is like both. Thank you very much. And uh, we can slowly on the lights again. And sorry for making your eyes blink all over again. <laughs> right. I have to make you experience it to understand that there are three types of vision, but it can be energized in various ways. Visions can be energized from, uh, we will return this to you afterwards. Vision can be energized from your inside. And I give you a verse for that. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 17 and 18. 
and the Holy Spirit energizes your spirit man and your spirit man becomes lighted up and you can see some things. Then it can be energized from the outside and the outside is like a gift of visions. That will be 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Among the nine gifts of the spirit is a gift of discerning of spirits. The gift of visions that God puts to you. It's the energizing from the outside that comes. It's the anointing upon. You can call it, what is anointing upon? What is anointing within? It's obvious from you that anointing is energy. So there's energy that comes from the outside, energy that comes from the inside. So sometimes when you're seeing in this revival, you're seeing visions, sometimes the energizing is coming from the outside. It could come from any of the four living creatures. And uh, they've been so good. They're working so closely with us, they've given us their name. And uh, so they're working uh, with each one of us in order to... And they're energizing everyone. They're sending energy uh, to each one of you. And uh, to each one who is part of this uh, initial first batch, the move. Because we call the 500 the first batch. There will be many that continue to work and God continue to train. They can energize from the outside, they can energize from the inside. When you're energized from the inside, any slight changes from the inside can affect the seed. Any slight changes on the inside can affect the seed. When it's energized from the outside, any slight changes on the outside can affect. Is, it, is there such a thing on the outside? Yes. For example, when the anointing is moving upon, like let's say in a worship or, or, or healing ministry or something, uh, when when people in general, and the Spirit is upon a group of people, whatever happens among the people on the outside can affect the anointing upon. Example of that, Jesus in his hometown. Jesus had a Spirit upon him. When he went to his hometown, he proclaimed, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. But yet he could not heal some of the sick people because of your unbelief. So the atmosphere on the outside affected the anointing. At other times you notice when Jesus was called to Jairus' house, Jairus' daughter had died. When he went there, along the way, Jairus, thought, Jairus came to Jesus while his daughter was sick. And when they were on the way, the daughter must have died. Or he might have died earlier because the funeral service was in process. So by the time they came near, the funeral service was going on and they, they brought news. They says, don't trouble the master anymore because the, the daughter has died. The story is found in the Gospel of Mark chapter 5. That's where the woman, the issue of blood also touched him along the way to Jairus' house. And then Jesus says, only believe, do not be afraid. And so he continued to the, all the way to Jairus' house, which was quite a distance. When they reached Jairus' house, the funeral procession was going on, and Jesus says, she sleeps. And all of them laugh, and jeer, and mock. The atmosphere was not conducive to healing. You know what Jesus did? He put all of them out. He cancelled the funeral service. Put all of them out, and then he only took Peter, James, and John, and also the family of uh, 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 Jairus to where the daughter is and he resurrected the girl from the dead. Because when you operate on the anointing upon, sometimes you seek to produce a proper external atmosphere in order for the Holy Spirit to work. When it's energized from the outside, external factors can affect. When it's energized from the inside, internal factors can affect. What internal factors? Whatever is going on in your spirit, soul, and body. Because it's from your inside. The best type of vision is when it's energized from the inside and the outside. 
Those are the most vivid, the most colorful and the clearest. And so in your experience of these downloads that is happening, I'd like to explain, having explained how to get into it, I'd like to explain how it operates so that you know how it operates and uh, flow with this uh, revival that is in this heavenly area. So now it's time for the chart that we have for you. First chart is the chart of the spirit, soul and body. Spirit, soul and body. I've explained the principles. Now we see in this and on the other, other second picture, yes. So we have our spirit, we have our soul and we have our body. When the Holy Spirit always works and the energizing always works from our spirit outwards. Always is that manner. Now notice you have your will, your mind and your emotion in your soul. It is possible that when your soul is not at rest, and here's the first rule, and I've described the methods and, and the, te the technicalities of how the things take place. I summarize again for you, three types of visions, open vision, closed vision, spiritual vision or inner vision, and there are two primary ways they energize, from the inside, from the outside, or a combination of both. Those are the technical things that are happening. I've given you the scripture. Now, let's look at the details. All energizing from the inside has to take place in your spirit man. But it involves your soul. This is the first rule that needs to take place. Hebrews 4 verse 10. Your soul must be at rest. If your soul is not at rest, the visions try to come and it cannot come clearly. <laughs> now what do we mean by the soul at rest? Then we bring the other chart. <coughs> what is consciousness? Thank you. The other chart, what is consciousness? Yes. Okay. We all experience this, and tonight you're going to experience this. Now, we have what we call, these are the brain waves that take place. Uh, research has found that the main, although different parts of your brain have electrical signals, the main part that causes the whole rhythm is your, in your hippocampus area. You have uh, above beta, of course, is the gamma where you know your whole physical being is involved. Uh, could be like sports or whatever. But other normal thing, your alert working is under beta waves, and uh, then alpha waves is slower, and then theta waves drowsy or uh, idling, then delta sleeping. There are two stages of delta: so, uh, dreamless sleep and uh, sleep dreaming. Now, this is the part where it's dreaming happening. You notice this part is exactly like the beta. And that's why they say this is rapid eye movement here. It's as if you're actually alert and conscious and how you function. This is the dream state. I'll just go very uh, slowly through one to show the number of cycles. Uh, EEG or what they call electro electroencephalograph. Okay, that's EEG. Now, beta waves is about 13 to 39 cycles per second. CPS. The short form for CPS is called Hertz. H-E-R-T-Z, named after uh, uh, some researcher. So it's 13 to, 13 to 39 Hertz or cycles per second. And uh, that's what it looks. Now remember, it might differ slightly with each individual. And uh, let's look further down. Okay, alpha waves is 8 to 12 cycles per second. And we go further down. Uh, theta, theta brain waves, 4 to 7 cycles per second. And then delta, 
0 0.5 to 4 cycles per second. Right? So we got all this mathematics. Now we go up again, all the way to the four ticks. So remember that delta base is about 0 0.5 to 4 cycles per second. And then uh, you have the one just uh, above it is a theta, which is about 4 cycles to so 7 cycles per second. And then you have um, the uh, alpha, which is about 8 cycles to so 12 cycles per second. And then you have beta, which is from 13 right up to 39 cycles per second and above that is gamma where physical activity all is involved is very much higher and uh, what happens is when you are asleep it is delta waves that is happening when you are awake you got two stages of wakefulness people who have problems sleeping have problem getting into the delta wave and uh, this is an example of physical rest. We have no examples of soul or spiritual rest. But we assume that if your ability to, to let your soul uh, knock off, you will enter the delta phase anyway. Uh, and there's no measurement for the spirit, of course. Uh, and so the, we are taking the biological measurement as a clue. Now, theta is somewhere between sleep and wake. Visions that occur when you are conscious occur usually within the low alpha to the theta phase. Low alpha to the theta phase. Visions that occur when you're asleep are called dreams of visions of the night. The Old Testament equates visions of the night with dreams. You find that in the book of Job 33. Also in the book of Daniel, you find that his dreams is sometimes called visions of the night. A uh, Hebrew word for that. In the Greek, the word dream, there are two Greek words for dream. One is the Greek word ona, which is the official sleeping type dream with delta waves. It says that Joseph had a dream and the angel spoke to him and told him to take his family and go down to Egypt. Then later he has a dream and the angel told him that Herod is dead and he can go back uh, to Israel. And that's how he end up in Nazareth instead of Bethlehem. So that is an ona dream. There is another type of dream that the, the Greek word calls inapneon. And that is more the theta phase, not the delta phase dream. That is inapneon. The book of Acts chapter 2 that we read for you today, where it says uh, young men shall see vision, old men shall dream dreams. The word dream dreams is not the word ona, which is the a real sleeping type of dream. The word dream is the word uh, inapneon. It's used twice. One is a word, one is a inap, inapneon. And uh, it is more a dreamlike state. We know that because it's only used a few times in the Bible. The only time it's used in the Bible is in the book of Jude. Where it's used in a negative sense, talking about daydreamers who dream all the evil things. So it's not referring to people who fall asleep. By referring to people who are like daydreaming or planning or plotting all the evil and, and wrong things. So is the word inapneon is used. So inapneon speaks about a phase of dreamlike quality, drowsy daydreaming, and you're still awake, more of the theta phase. When your brain wave, talking about the biological area, which uh, is a reflection of your soul. And by the way, your brain wave is related to your soul. If your soul were to leave your body, you will be brain dead. You will be brain dead. And so there's still that connection. But if the cord is cut and the spirit and the soul leave the body, the body can be perfect, but there will be no brain activity. 
the brain activity is a symptom of the spirit and soul inside happening. Something is causing it. It's not just a biological thing. And so it's interesting to have this uh, measurement of the EEG. And uh, what we need to understand, like for example, uh, when um, TL was sharing about uh, what his download that he was receiving, uh, he mentioned that it was between sleep and wake. And then he also uh, had certain dreams that would be Pita phase. And uh, then when uh, Ishani was sharing, she was talking about some dreams she has, that would be the uh, Delta phase with some dreams here. And uh, then the other time she has is just probably a vision that you see in the low alpha area. And uh, when Sandy was sharing that, uh, she talks about how she seems to be having this picture uh, that comes to her. Now, it doesn't matter whether the quality or the technicality of your vision is open vision, closed vision, or spiritual vision. It doesn't matter. A vision is a vision is a vision. A vision by any other name is still a vision. Quoting from the rose. And uh, so, uh, doesn't matter how it's technicality, it is still a vision. It can still be as real as any other visions. And so, when someone has an open vision, it does not mean that their quality of the vision is better than an inner vision. There's no such thing. These are what we call technical ways the vision can come. It is more important what the actual quality of the download that determines the quality of the vision. And the best is, of course, energizing from both inside and the outside. Uh, tonight is a good night for you to practice. But, if possible, avoid the delta phase. <laughs> and, uh, so, we don't mind you going on the theta phase. But most of you will hit the theta phase at several times. And, uh, but let me talk about the alpha to the beta phase. The reason why some of you are not able to see is because you are always in the beta mode. Your mind is in the beta mode. So what is the beta mode? Beta mode is always thinking, always solving, always thinking about different things. As long as you're thinking about different things, whether of work, of church, of your family, of things to do, or what you're going to eat tomorrow, or what's going to happen in the next durian season, or what you're going to do, your plan, your, your fast is coming up, you're planning, what you're going to do in your Chinese New Year. Uh, as long as you're thinking, planning, sorry for you, you're in beta, beta phase. The only way visions can come in the beta or in the gamma phase is from the outside. It's from the outside. When God interrupts you. I did not say a vision cannot come. Remember that. I did not say that. So don't jump to conclusions on some things I haven't said. Visions can come anytime, any day, anytime. Throughout the whole Bible. But I'm explaining how different visions come at different places and how to put yourself easier to receive different types of vision. When a vision is externally energized, or like say, if someone got struck by lightning and permanently an open vision, then the vision operates with a beta or gamma phase scale. Because that is externally caused. Lightning is external, correct? Is a permanent external cause. And uh, all Moses, when he was in the wilderness in the book of Exodus, chapter 2, 
and he saw a burning bush. Beta face was still working because he was thinking, the bush is burning, but it didn't burn up. And he told himself, I will go and see why the bush doesn't burn. So it's still beta face operating. And as he went there with his rational thinking, wanting to understand what is happening, God spoke to him. Remember, God still can give visions from outside. At beta or at gamma phase. And, uh, but the best way to respond to visions or to be open to visions is say why? Because visions that come based at the at the beta and the gamma phase are what we call gifts of the Holy Spirit operating. It's externally caused by the working of the Holy Spirit. The gift of discerning of spirit or the gift of visions that God is operating. And they cause something to be energized from the outside to a certain extent. Uh, they can come, but there's a law that operates it. It will operate led by the Spirit. Kenneth again talk about this operation of the gift. And he said he cannot <coughs> he cannot turn on <coughs> anytime he wants. It says it comes as the spirit wills. He cannot just turn it on. And sometimes you need the work of an angel. Uh, William Abraham, before he went astray and then died in 1965, before he went to wrong teaching, at the beginning of his ministry, he had his first vision when he went to the forest to pray to find out what is this phenomenon that's happening in his life because he had heard these voices and these warnings about keeping himself for God. And then in his fasting and prayer, he saw a ball of light came came in in some uh, heart of fo uh, in a forest somewhere uh, where he was waiting on God in fasting. And this ball out of this ball of light came the angel. That was his first vision. And so that angel, who happened to be Fanuel, spoke to him. And then from that day onward, he began to have visions whenever the angel comes. So that vision is energized externally by an angel. So remember, the Holy Spirit can energize you directly. The Holy Spirit can energize even physical matter, like the burning bush. The, the energy was flowing into the bush, correct? It was an actual bush. In fact, if you were one of the sheep or goat or cattle or whatever Moses was taking care of, if you look up, you will see, oh, there's a fire there, I better avoid it. Even the goat or the donkey would have seen the fire burning that didn't burn the bush up because it was energized externally. Angels and, uh, and the Holy Spirit. And in fact, it was actually energized by an angel. Because the Bible in the New Testament says it was an angel that Moses met. And the covenant of the law was given to the mediation of an angel. Paul we'll talk about that. Although the angels spoke in the first person of God. So angels can energize on the outside. And for William Abraham, when he ministered, sometimes when he finishes his preaching, I think there could be a few videos that stay available online, he will walk about and waiting. See, no waiting for what? Waiting for his angel to come. And only when his angel comes, then can he start seeing visions and telling things about people and performing signs and wonders and miracles. So he needed the angel to come and energize different things. Angels and Holy Spirit and of course the four living creatures can energize from the outside. So in this phase here is energizing from the outside. It is possible. What about Matthew chapter 5 verse 8? Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. The verse that we have quoted in this series. Tell me, is that energizing from the inside or outside? How many of you think it's energizing from the outside? How many of you think that it's energizing from the inside? See, so you got your answer. So if you want to claim Matthew chapter 5 verse 8, 
You have to understand the laws of the energizing from the inside. Now the difference is this. The energizing from the inside, since it's from your spirit man, to a certain extent, once you learn the skill, you can turn it on and off. Okay, tonight is all night prayer. We pray in tongues. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 14 and 15, If I pray in a tongue, my understanding is unfruitful. So obviously not energized by his mind. Energized by his spirit. So if I pray in tongue, my understanding is unfruitful. My spirit prayer, but my understanding is unfruitful. He said, what is it then? I will pray with the understanding. I will pray with the spirit. I will sing with my understanding. I will sing with my spirit. In other words, he will do both. He could switch between them. The way Paul says it, and which is true in our life today, you can turn on tongues when you want. For those who are new to the baptism, baptism in the spirit, they're still new to how the spirit flow in that. And we all learn. I remember when I was new to the baptism in the spirit as a Baptist, I still didn't know how to flow and let the spirit flow and speak in tongues. My tongues was only a few syllables. And so it didn't go much. But through the years, we learned the flow with the Holy Spirit. We began to learn the mechanics of it, the technicalities of it. And now, you can turn on your tongues anytime you want. You can even control how loud or how soft. Although young Christians sometimes cannot control. So when you speak in tongues, you can turn it on and off. And they were all in your brown, big You can stop, you can start anytime you want. Lost beauty and grace is for you to be whole and see. That's the interpretation for you. So you can turn it on and off. You could Put it at different keys. You can speak in tongue in a very low key. So some people don't know that they can speak in tongues in different key. You are in control. Just like I can speak in English in different keys. Right? So what about tongues? Tongues is a language that God gives you. I'm speaking in English I'm still speaking in English Let's go to G I'm speaking in English Right? So tongues of course is the same You can speak in different keys You can go low, you can go high But people who are freshly baptized in the Spirit say I cannot control, cannot control When the Spirit comes <laughs> So they have to learn how to control. And maybe they have to be put somewhere where by themselves they pray until they learn how to control. Now, now remember, we always give room for young Christians. We give room for people to grow. Give room for people to make genuine mistakes. We give room for a bit of zeal. Right? A bit of zeal extra is better than no zeal. And uh, it's like someone says, it's better to have fire with a little wildfire than no fire. Uh, nah. So, uh, that's, that's important because uh, it's part of it. You know when you plant rice or wheat uh, uh, and all that, when the rice is growing, the wheat is growing, it's protected by a husk. And the husk is important. The husk is there to protect the actual grain until it's ready to be harvested. But the husk after the, the rice or the wheat is right, is useless. The husk is useless. So you've got to separate the husk away. But it was important while it was growing. Correct? So sometimes in a revival when people are new to the things of God, please allow room for people to make mistakes. Genuine mistakes. Where uh, there's a lot of husk a lot of uh, a lot of uh, emotions, a lot of different. A little bit is okay. We didn't control, and uh, so that's understandable. We allow a person to grow out. People can grow out. Just like 
if we have little children, little children will behave like little children. And we adults understand that. Family people understand, parents understand that. You give a little bit of room. Once in a while, they might be really louder, a bit scream a bit, you know. But uh, we give a little bit of room. They're just children. But then child grows up to be 21, behave the same way we don't, cannot tolerate anymore. So there's a time when you say, hey, that phase is over. In the same way, we mature in tongues. And then we realize, here's the thing people don't like of tongues. Tongues you can also uh, pray fast or pray slow. You can pray, Or you can pray, You can pray fast or slow. There's so much control that you can have. You can turn it on, turn it off. You can pray fast, pray slow. And then you can be in different languages too. And different type of tongues that, that God can give. You can tune to different different languages. When you meet me in heaven, I actually speak in heavenly tongue. Uh, but you hear it in English. And uh, when I write in heaven, the scrolls are all written in heavenly language. Uh, they are not written. Early language, not good enough. Cannot be used up there. No qualified, not sanctified enough. And uh, although you still can hear in English, so when you go to heaven and uh, and, and you meet Jesus uh, and you hear the saints and all the saints talk to you in English, you say, "Wow, English, ah, uh, even international language of heaven." <laughs> no, 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 no! You just heard it in English. We're all speaking in tongues up there, and uh, it's just what you heard in your soul. So there's a measure of control. In the same way. When your visions are energized from your inside, from the inside, you need to understand a lot of things that's happening that is going on on your inside. That is, these factors will affect. If energized from your inside, beta, gamma, EEG, not good. Because they disrupt your ability. You have to have a low alpha to theta, which means you've got to be in an alpha state before theta. Alpha state is relaxed and reflecting, which is reflecting of Hebrews 4, verse 10. They shall enter the rest. Do you know that Hebrews 4 was talking about this revival? Not just Hebrews, shall. Yeah? Okay, let me recall for you the whole chapter. In Hebrews 4 verse 1, it says there is a promise of the rest that not everyone has entered into. So even in Paul's time, not everybody entered the rest. Then he talks about the Old Testament saints, how Joshua brought them into the land as a symbol of rest and all those things. And he says, but Joshua did not get them rest. The rest is actually Jesus who gave them the true rest. And he says, there's a promise for all to enter the rest. Let us enter the rest, he says in Hebrews 4, verse 11. And you know what the final rest is? After Hebrews 4, 12, that tells you the technicality. What's the last section of Hebrews 4? Enter the throne room. Look again, it's in your Bible. It's prophetic. Well, we might as well look at the Bible, keep this going. In the Bible for a moment, in Hebrews 4. It's all prophetic of what we are experiencing today. It amazes how the Word of God is hidden just for us. After you enter the rest, which is verse 10, verse 11, and verse 12, and uh, then from verse 13, you start coming into His presence. There is no creature hidden from His sight. Hey, you are just coming to His presence. And all things are naked, open to the eyes of Him, and we must give account. They're talking about throne room from verse 13. Verse 14. See, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. See, we are entering the heavenly place. Then by verse 15, 16, by verse 16, you are the throne of grace. It is prophetic of what we're talking about. When Paul wrote it, there was a due fulfillment. One normal Christian teaching, one prophetic about what we're experiencing tonight and today. And when you enter the rest, you enter into the place of the throne room where God wants you. 
So we need this alpha phase which is relaxed, reflecting and a restful state. What is the alpha phase like? The alpha phase is when you're not really thinking. You are appreciating. It is semi-passive. I won't call it 100% passive. When you are in a cinema watching a movie, you're in partial alpha phase. The sitting. Although some people they think a lot with the movie. But normally you don't do any thinking. The movie does all the thinking for you. You're just appreciating the story. You're watching a play. You're watching a performance or orchestra. You're not thinking. When you're watching an orchestra, you're not critiquing. Hmm, I wonder whether they dress properly. Or not. Hmm, I wonder what that guy is doing. No, you're not thinking. You're appreciating. Appreciating. That is why the alpha phase involved enter his gates with thanksgiving, into his courts with praise. You're not thinking. You are thanksgiving. You are appreciating who God is. Thank you, Lord. You're worshipping. Which I worship helps you also. Music helps you. And as we are worshipping, as we are as we are appreciating all that God has done, and or you sit down next to a very nice scenic place, admiring the scenery. Or admiring the path in the garden as you walk and all the flowers along the way. This is all alpha phase. In my spiritual world book, I call that being spiritual. You read the book again. I talk about how being spiritual is not being pseudo-spiritual. Where when you enter the spirit realm, you say, I'm now in the spirit realm. Like, what are you talking like that? Because I'm uh, now in the spirit realm. And your eyes break like that. <laughs> like a half demon possessed or whatever. No. So, being spiritual is not weird. It's not being weird. Being spiritual is normal because we are main spiritual beings. Being spiritual is being very restful and being a uh, part of his creation. It is um, like uh, you're walking in the garden and you're appreciating all the things that God has made around you. You're not thinking of how, how and how and what, you're just appreciating. Jesus himself says in Matthew chapter 6, he says, Do not worry. Worrying goes into the better mode. But appreciating, thanksgiving. So the first Rule is to be at rest. And I've gone very detailed. Enter into this place where you're just appreciating God. Uh, being at a restful state. Uh, and somewhere in this stage, and you learn after some time. You learn after some time. And some of you, sometimes you ask a question. Besides all night prayer, where some of you are tired you know, and it's normally sleeping time, then sometimes you listen to the sermon, you fall asleep, that's okay. Sleep okay, you don't snore. And, uh, or sometimes you, even in a Sunday or normal day, in the afternoon, sometimes afternoon service, or you just have a heavy meal or whatever. And uh, may I remind you, you stay in your 40 day fast. And also, <laughs> And so sometimes you're tired and your eyes are drip, uh, droopy. Uh, and it's understandable, it became a natural cause. But the other cause of sometimes sleepiness, uh, and we, when you're enough rest, you're enough, you're really not supposed to be tired, and then when you sit down to hear God's word, you start droopiness and drowsiness. You start reading the Bible, start being drowsy, start praying, being drowsy. You know why? It's because the the Bible has helped you to relax. And you're actually entering into a low alpha theta phase. You're entering theta phase. Don't forget that uh, in this article that I have, 
Some yogis and mystics take 50 years to meditate until they can enter Gita phase easily. You, in one minute, read Bible, uh, Gita phase. <laughs> Where it comes in. Pray, uh, Gita phase. You should consider it a gift. <laughs> but remember, that it's at the theta phase between sleep and wake that your, your inner energizing can take place. After a while, what happens is this. You learn how to enter into theta phase while still awake. So, the sleepiness is not there, but you're still wide awake. And at that state, easy to see visions. It's like you're between two worlds and the energizing is coming from your inside. Of course, like I say, when the energizing is from your inside and from the outside, it's the most vivid visions you will ever experience in your life. So the first rule of thumb is to be at this restful state. Now, those of you who are in the beta phase, uh, especially some of you who have dreams or cannot remember your dreams, you do enter the dream state, it's because most of your life you're, you're functioning here. And as a result, you don't have this part. You see, you jump from here to here, here to here, here to here. And this phase is missing in your life. The re ability to recall what you dream the ability to remember pictures that you come across that you see is in these two phases here. And may I go as far as to say that many, peop many people like that, uh, when they wake up, they jump from here, shoom, to here. They don't have this in-between phase. Whereas for some people, when they wake up, they still lie around uh, a little bit more. Uh, yeah. Or they're actually awake, but they're lying down. They're slowly getting their body up and all that. Because those are those who need those theta and alpha phase. So they get up also slowly. Remember here, 0 0.5 sec 5 cycles per second to 4, to 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, right? So some of us are... That, that's right. Some of, some of you go from here 0 0.45 to Can I get it? Get it? Sleep. Can I get it? And you walk, 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 you go to bed, you knock up, boom. So you keep jumping between this phase. So your brain is not trained in this phase. Not trained in that phase at all. All night prayer, tonight good training. <laughs> so. Learn how to train. It, and, uh, so remember, online prayer is online prayer. Although we appreciate and know the ability, if it's too cold, you can go out, warm yourself up, and go outside and die. But remember, online prayer is online prayer. It's not fellowship time. After all, now we got fellowship time, right? When I'm away, second service is fellowship time. And so, online prayer is online prayer. Don't sit down there and then fellowship, 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 fellowship until 6 a.m. And then, or five minutes before 6 or, or 5 o'clock when I start the meeting, then you come in. Oh, okay. So, remember, you came not just to receive, you came to participate. You came to be trained. You came to enter into something. Something that one day, we don't have the opportunity to train you so small groups. Now is when we can train you, teach you. By the time we reach 1,000 people, 10,000 people, 100,000 people, 10,000 churches around the world, how often do you think we can meet like that? This is meeting in the spirit. So remember, be trained, learn. Then what you experience, still can share, ask questions and all those throughout this training phase uh, to be guided. So that's rule number one. So you say, well, we don't have point number two. We have uh, only point number two. That's all. We won't go too far. Okay, we can take this off and we put the first chart on. Thank you. The first chart on. Thank you. 
So here is a spirit man, and uh, the first rule is we need to enter into a rest. The type of spiritual rest that affect your physical and your soul. Second rule is this. When you are anxious to receive something, that anxiety works against you. Although this is a time of entering heaven and being in throne room, when the moment you pray, you say, I must enter throne room, I must enter throne room, I must enter throne room, the whole night you'll be like that. You never enter. Although you're dead, never experience. Because that's not the way. So what do you focus? If you focus on entering throne room, so your, your mind, you, your focus, or oh, visualize throne room, visualize, visualize, visualize. You even do a drawing, look at it. Look at it. Drawing. <laughs> Whatever. It's not going to help. Your focus is not on seeing vision. Surprisingly. When you try too hard to see, you are trying to cause something. Visions of this nature are not initiated by you. It is to come to you. You cannot try to produce. Then it is your production, which is different. So if your production, God doesn't, you know, it's, it, it, it's, not, it's not from heaven. It's your own production. And uh, you have to focus on something. So what do you focus on? Focus on the love of God and on loving God. Focus on God's love and enjoy the love of God. If I use the word focus, might be the wrong word to use. Because focus also, you say, okay, he says focus on love. Uh, okay, also wrong. So, enjoy God's presence and love. Being like a little child. Rule number two, enjoyment. You have to enjoy the moment when there is no vision so that when the visions come, you enjoy the vision. Don't start your enjoyment only when the vision comes. You enjoy your soul so much that you say, whether vision or not, no vision, I'm going to enjoy this presence of God. I'm just going to enjoy myself, feel with God's love and the love of God in my life. And as you enjoy the love of God, remember, the love of God has energy. It energizes faith in Galatians 5 verse 6. In Ephesians chapter 3, it talks about Christ in us. Look at Ephesians chapter 3 again very carefully to solidify this point. So my first point was uh, Hebrews 4, the whole chapter. My second point is Ephesians 3, the whole chapter. Say, so why the whole chapter? Because it starts very carefully with this mystery that God wants to show us. And uh, in fact, as I put it to you, the whole, the whole chapter 12 of uh, Hebrews is talking about us today in this revival. The whole chapter 4 of Hebrews is talking about us today in this revival coming to the throne room. The whole chapter 3 of Ephesians is the same thing. It talks about our time, it was to the dispensation of the grace of God. That has brought us to the fellowship of the mystery which is hidden in God from other ages and now revealed in our time. And notice in verse uh, 16, he prayed that the inner man would be strengthened. The inner man would be strengthened. And once the inner man is strengthened, notice several things had to do with love. Rooted and grounded in love, verse 17, verse 18, that you may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width, length, depth, and high to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Notice, the knowing of God's love fills you with the fullness of God. When you are filled with the fullness of God, that is the place where visions occur. 
Because when the Holy Spirit pour on you, which is God filling us with the Spirit, His presence, visions occur. Now notice, the fullness of God are pouring on the Spirit. The two are together. But before the fullness of God is to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge. So it's not with your beta brainwave that you know it. It's with the alpha brainwave. Then you're appreciative of that fullness of God, of the love of God. You're appreciating the love of God. You're thankful for the love of God. And there's a width, the length, the depth, the height. And there's knowing of God's love. And notice how it's tied back, the rooting and grounded of God's love in you is tied back to the strength of your inner man. And Christ dwelling in you, the presence of Christ in you. So, rule two is to just enjoy God's love. Draw into God's love and just enjoy this wonderful love that God has for you. Even you see no vision, know no vision, experience no vision, you benefit from just absorbing the love of God. And so that is energizing you from inside and energizing you from the outside because Christ is on the outside and on the inside. God is on the outside and on the inside. In Him we live and move and have our being. And don't worry about the visions. Even in this move, when you hear others having them, and uh, encountering God, and tonight, some of you are going to continue to encounter the saints. I uh, appreciate in this. Maybe I just throw in rule number three since we are in the flow. Personal worship. When you're just in deep in personal worship or just caught up in this worship, praying in tongues, singing in tongues in God, it flows easier. Because when you pray in tongues, you edify yourself. What is the word edify? It's from the word build up. Build up with what? Build up with energizing. We need a certain level of energizing in order for the vision to take place. I have explained the technicality and I explained the rules. Rule 1, be at rest. Rule 2, to the love of God. Rule 3, worship. And as you enter into that phase, tonight you can enjoy whatever God wants to do. Walk in heaven, live in heaven, explore all the boundaries of heaven. And allow God to do His work in you. Praise God. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, we thank you for your grace, your mercy upon each one of our lives. We ask, O oh God, that you cause us to enter into this phase, in this revival by your grace. And we know, Father, we are in the company of in, we are in innumerable company of angels. We are before the general assembly of the Church of God. Firstborn registered in heaven and of the spirits of just man made perfect. And we thank you that he has made the word of God come alive. Let your angels teach and impart as you so fit. Let the saints teach and impart as you so determine, Father. And let Jesus and you, Father, and the Holy Spirit have your full and free reign in each one of our lives. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all rise together. We sing a little bit in the spirit. And then we are going to prayer in the spirit. And let the Lord work throughout the night. Thank you, Father.